Here with us to examine these issues is perhaps one of the most qualified people in Chicago. Over the course of his career, Prexy has made more than 100 trips to Africa, including trips taken in secret to apartheid torn South Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, former Rhodesia, and Namibia, former Southwest Africa. Um, Prexy has lectured and written extensively both in the United States and abroad, publishing one book and articles in some 25 international journals. He was interviewed in the 1993 documentary about police brutality in Chicago, The End of the Nightstick, and also served as a co-writer on the 1999 BBC PBS production of the People's Century film segment, Skin Deep, a documentary about racism in the United States and South Africa. Today, he teaches African history courses at Chicago's Columbia College and takes people on educational, cultural, and political tours to various third world countries, regions, and situations, both abroad and in the United States. Please give a very warm welcome to Prexy Nesbitt. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I hate these introduction moments. You never know what to do. You keep your head up, you keep it down. <laughs> you are the person, look around for somebody else to be the person. <laughs> I can't stand it. Um, I want to go through a lot of material and have spent some time working on this. But uh, first, I want to say very profound thanks to Jane and to Landon C and to the Illinois Council on the Humanities. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure for me to do this. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, but first, let's, uh, let me show you a little clip to sort of start. Would you hit that clip real quick? Sure. Because of my deep interest and affection for a land settled by the Dutch in the mid-17th century, then taken over by the British and at last independent. A land in which the native inhabitants were at first subdued, but relations with whom remain a problem to this day. A land which defined itself on a hostile frontier. A land which attained rich natural resources through the energetic application of modern technology. A land which was once the importer of slaves and now must struggle to wipe out the last traces of that form of bondage. I refer, of course, to the United States of America. Well, Bobby Kennedy speaking in Cape Town, South Africa. And you heard the laughter and the applause because everybody thought he was leading right into a discussion about South Africa. But the parallels are so great that that opening could apply to either South Africa or the United States. I have two titles for this talk tonight, and one you've seen. The other one, though, is I call it Velveteen Illusions and Daily Mini 1919s, Constructing Societies That Belong to All. Let me quote a constitutional preamble. We the people of honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, and believe that belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. Does anybody know what country that's the preamble for their constitution? Anybody familiar with it? in terms of the United States? Does it ring to anybody here? It, it's the South African Constitution of 1994. And I've always been particularly struck with the phrase that says, believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. The Velveteen, in my second title, comes from a children's story. You all know that story? We almost all, the Velveteen Rabbit. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes sort of along with the, uh, the Le Petit Prince. Has anybody ever read The Little mm -hmm. Prince, the Saint Exupéry story? And it's, they're both about stories about love, 
about inclusion, about embracing the different. You know, the rabbit wants to be a rabbit so desperately. <coughs> and he finally, a real rabbit, and he finally reaches that. Um, I'm playing a bit with you a little bit because I want to get into the real nitty gritty of what I want to talk about, and it's so uh, harsh that I want to remind you that we, there's a goal, there is a value here. In 1935, Richard Wright wrote a poem. It's called Between the World and Me. And part of it reads in the following way. There was a design of white bones slumbering forgottenly upon a cushion of ashes. There was a charred stump of a sapling pointing a blunt finger accusingly at the sky. There were torn tree limbs, tiny veins of burnt leaves, and a scorched coil of greasy hemp. A vacant shoe, an empty tie, a ripped shirt, a lonely hat, and a pair of trousers stiff with black blood. And upon the trampled grass were buttons, were buttons, dead matches, butt ends of cigars and cigarettes, peanut shells, a drained gin flask, and a whore's lipstick. Scattered traces of tar, restless arrays of feathers, and the lingering smell of gasoline. My voice was drowned in the roar of their voices, and my black, wet body slipped and rolled in their hands as they bound me to the sapling. And my skin clung to the bubbling hot tar falling from me in limp patches and the down and quills of the white feathers sank into my raw flesh and I moaned in my agony. Then my blood was cooled mercifully, cooled by a baptism of gasoline. And in a blaze of red, I leaped to the sky as pain rose like water, boiling my limbs, panting, begging, I clutched childlike clutch to the hot sides of death. <coughs> now I am dry bones, and my face a stony skull, staring in yellow surprise at the sun. Richard Wright's poem is a response to at least three major historical events that were what I call many racial riots the 1919 Chicago race riot, one of the most severe of the race riots that happened in this country in that summer of 1919, with 38 people killed, 538 people injured, and a thousand black families made homeless. And then there was the 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma riot, with 10,000 black people made homeless, and somewhere, some say 300 people were killed. And then there was the 1923 January 5th riot that destroyed Rosewood, Florida, leaving 80 dead and thousands made homeless. Richard Wright's poem was also a response to the recorded 3,959 black people lynched in a dozen southern states between 1877 and 1950. I know that figure well because a friend of mine about two years ago who works with schools in Massachusetts and he got a call from a principal and the principal said, can you come and join us? We have a big crisis here in my school. And the crisis was that a group, it was a predominantly white school, a few black kids, six or seven, out of maybe 800 kids. The white seventh grade boys had decided they wanted to lynch a black boy. And they wanted to see what it was like to lynch this black boy. It was two, three years ago. And they had him in the noose. They brought the noose from home. They had him in the noose. There was a young white girl who went running to some of the teachers who were all in the corner of the yard, schoolyard, drinking, talking 
drinking coffee, and they ran. She ran to get them. And so the teachers stopped it. School principal sent all of the boys involved home, and then the parents started organizing. Because the principal suspended them. The parents said this was not necessary. This was just a case of boys being boys. So it was not necessary to suspend them or to have them face any consequences. What were all these things about? Even the event I'd suggest to you in Massachusetts, what are they about? They're about organized racist attacks by whites on blacks. But they also involved, especially the one here in Chicago, black people adopting armed self-defense measures. This is my turf right here. I was the first young black person to ever be in this neighborhood in 1948. My, fam my family had moved in at California and Washington and they rolled me into the church Sunday school, the church that's only a block and a half from here. It was then called the Warren Avenue Congregational Church. I had a broken leg. They put me in a coaster wagon and rolled me in at five years into this church. And I always used to say to my father, why'd you do that, Dad? Those folks wanted to lynch me. Shit, what could I do? I couldn't even run away. You had a broken leg. Roller wagon. As I was at Antioch College in the 1965 66 period, this church, only a block and a half, became the center for Martin Luther King's work here in the city of Chicago to try to deal with the racism up north, as he said. And so we organized all around this neighborhood. And King and the whole movement was based out of that church right there. So I know this area very, very well. Let me come back though to talk a little bit more about these racial riots. Because the racial riots in these and other cities followed somewhat a kind of similar pattern. They often began with a relatively small scale incident, but then the greater mission of those in the area was to take on the protection and of the structure and practice of white supremacy. That's what happened here in Chicago. It started out with a small incident. People swimming near 55th Street in Lake Michigan. But as it swelled, it became about much, much more. It became about the protection of something we can only really refer to as white supremacy. I'll say more about that in a minute. And white supremacy is, I mean, the sort of a conveying of attitudes and, and, and positions and values that assert that white people matter and that black people have no matter, have no meaning. In, in the South African situation, they call it baska. Bas means boss in Afrikaans. In the South African situation, it, and I think in our situation, it's part of a hierarchy, this white supremacist attitude that's written so deeply into the culture of this country. It's one in which, in South Africa, they articulate it much more clearly because in South Africa, you have a a very explicit hierarchy, white people, Indians, colors, and then you have uh, pets, and then below pets you have kaffirs or niggers. And that's the way all food is set up in the apartheid system. If you go to the store and you get the remnants of pet food would be what you'd serve your servants. So that, that hierarchy expressed the way in which the hierarchy of white supremacy worked in apartheid South Africa. I'm not so sure it's that different here in this country. And it's so internalized in our country 
that we sometimes like to pretend it doesn't happen here, that it doesn't exist here. But my cousin and I, who is about my age, go into a lot of restaurants and I have to deal with the reality of white, younger waitresses saying to me, what can I do for you boys? And I don't fight it anymore. I, I remember once going to blows almost with a man in southern Illinois calling my father a boy. But it, it's, so, it's so hopeless to fight it here at this point. It, it's like also guys, you know? It's, it's, this, it's this such cold internalization of a hierarchy and evaluation of people that I think is the practice of white supremacy here in this country. For years in the United States, the mob or the noose, the fire and the Klan controlled black populations, particularly in the post-slavery South. Historian George Fredrickson talks about and notes in his classic book, White Supremacy, that it was the mobs in the South and in South Africa, it was the South African army. I want to suggest tonight that those mobs have been replaced by policing in northern cities in those countries that are the regulators of white supremacy. What we are seeing today in the police killings is much more than an aberrant policeman who is a rotten apple in the otherwise fine crate of fruit. What we are seeing in the exploding sagas here in Chicago and elsewhere, but especially here, is more the specter of policing as a method of hired gendarmes protecting capital and buildings as members of the former African-American patrolmen's league here in Chicago used to say. I want to urge you all to have some point that you interact with this wonderful group of men and women who have been the brave cutting edge of the Chicago Police Force known as the African American Patrolman's League, AAPL. And they could share with you such an insight on policing here in the city of Chicago. And one of the things they tell you is that it's about being a gendarme for capital. And I think, I, I have a friend here, a former student of mine, who is here, and I hope in the Q&A, maybe she'll say some things about what it must have been like for her as a white woman in this area, when it was all black. And she would be the only white person. I know she was known. People would say to me, yeah, your friend, uh, the white girl on the bike, yeah, she's around now. <laughs> <laughs> and she, 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 she could share. I'd love to know what the police had to say to her and about her. It's important that we probe what's happening today very deeply. I think there is a relationship between the numbers of police killings of unarmed civilians and the total numbers of guns possessed in this country. The Guardian newspaper in Britain has been doing a fantastic job looking at this whole story of what's unfolding. And they have a figure now of 1,134 police killings in 2015 alone. And I think that's very related to the 300 million arms. That's the figure people talk about, estimate 300 million arms in this country. There's also a relationship, I think, between national, between the, the, the national police killing rate and the fact with 31% of weapons exported, the United States produces and sells more weapons than any other nation in the world. There is a relationship, I think, as well between the police killings and the number of international armed interventions that we have done all over the world. 57 attempts since 1949 are the number 
of attempted interventions we've done somewhere in the world. You all have never heard of, perhaps, Diego Garcia, a small island in the Indian Ocean that we took off, took over by force because we wanted it as a Navy base just since 1949. When it comes to examining the value system, the normative framework underlying the police offensive that we've seen from killings to the racist and illegal Sears, Holman Square. You know, we're sitting here tonight only blocks away from what's called the Holman Square detention facility. When you drive out of this community, drive and go by Roosevelt Road and Holman, drive by the Sears Tower that the Art Institute is now using for some kind of a project. And a, right around the corner from that tower is a nondescript, unidentified police facility in which they have had 1,800 black men and women taken in there, questioned with no access to a lawyer, and held indefinitely. Some, I'm told, chained to desk inside that facility. I have a suspicion, knowing this neighborhood, that that whole Sears complex has other horrible stories behind it. Because related to the Sears complex, and also only blocks away from here, was what was known as Fillmore Square, Fillmore's police station. Fillmore was famous. The word was if you went to Fillmore police station, you are gonna get busted, you are gonna get beat up automatically. So I remember getting busted by the police on Sacramento only a block or so away from here because of some black women being harassed by police. And like a crazy young black man, I went in and intervened and the police threw me down on the ground. My cousins were in the car. They had to call my parents, my father, and my uncles, all of them got over there right away to Fillmore Police Station because they knew what would happen given time. And I remember hearing one black policeman come by and say to one of the white police, I'd have shot his ass, talking about how he would have treated and dealt with me. Because this is, this is a culture that transcends race, this police culture of brutalization that goes on. What's the normative framework behind all this stuff? Which major military nations in the world have not joined the International Criminal Court or the treaties banning landmines, cluster bombs, racial discrimination, discrimination against women or weapons in space or those establishing rights of migrant workers, regulating the arms trades, providing protection from the disappearances, defending the rights of people with disabilities or the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights or the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which nations in the world have not joined any of those? There's only one nation, and that's the United States. Not signed any of those things. And I say to you, that's very directed, directly related. And speaking of things like this, we've got to speak of Commander John Burge. You all know John Burge? John Burge is money, your taxpayer money is still paying for all of the people that he tortured. But you also then got to look at what's called the Reed interrogation technique and look at the whole practice of solitary confinement. And then look also at the whole question of torture. And as you look at this general question, how striking it is, the use of torture and the relationship that's now been established between the American Psychological Association and how it helps secretly to formulate methods of torture for the CIA during the Bush administration. The American Psychological Association. Now it's been reversed. But the role that it played formulating torture underscored a certain set of values. It provided a certain legal an ethical justification for torture. A brilliant friend of mine, Professor John Higginson, recently wrote a book 
It's called Collective Violence and the Agrarian Origins of South African Apartheid. It's a book I really recommend to you because he looks as much at the United States as he does at South Africa as I'm attempting to do. And early in the book, he cites a study that raises what I think is a definitive kind of question. It's a question that in my own life experience, people like Mandela and Martin Luther King and Amil Cabral, these great leaders of great movements would have asked the same question. Because they were great movements, because they, un great leaders of great movements, because they understood the necessity of getting to the root of oppressive situations. The question John formulates here is, significance is not the same as causation. If we want to understand causation, it is really heavy stuff. The victims have something to tell us, but the perpetrators have more to tell us. We must in some sense free ourselves from all the powerful limitations that identifying with the victims imposes upon us if we want to really understand the causes of what's been happening. So we must, and I want to try to hurry here a little bit, we must, as I suggest to you tonight, as part of totally dismantling the police killing system that has been operating in this city, we must begin to look more critically at the perps. You all know that phrase on all the TV shows. On the cops, they always say perps. I want to look at the cops at the perps. And look at the perps here and their police subculture. Do you all, anybody, you all, anybody here from the southwest side of Chicago? Interesting. Anybody from the northwest side of Chicago? So uh, <coughs> you, you know Saganash. Who, who else said? You know Saganash? Anybody from the south at all? Beverly? Anybody know Beverly? <laughs> Saganash on the northwest side, Beverly on the south side, those are police cultures. What I'm suggesting is we got to begin to understand what it is that fuels and forms the values that these police operate out of. And their home cultures, this ain't going to be an easy project, but their home cultures is one source of that. You know, I was up in one not long ago, and I got, I got to Jane, I'm, I'm really trying to make sure I hurry on this. I was up in one not long ago, and I just was coming to see somebody, and I got out of my car, and I knew I know this guy was a policeman. But as I got out of my car, he then went back in his house and came out cradling a shotgun, just cradling a shotgun, just to let me know what neighborhood I was in, to remind me as if I didn't know already <laughs> what neighborhood I was in and had planned to keep my car running because that's the kind of neighborhoods, when you get in these police neighborhoods, the hostility comes immediately upon you. But I think it's very important to know these police in a way that we don't know them now. It's like in the struggles against apartheid, in the struggles against Portuguese colonialism, we were told we have to understand better how the Portuguese function, why they did what they did. Institutionally transforming the Chicago police killing problem is inextricably part of a much larger challenge. I, I, I'm talking about real, it's what, it's what um, Black Lives Matter. It's what all those folks marching were talking about, changing. But what I'm talking about is we've got to change it in a way that it doesn't come back in another form. It's a surreal, see a real change for the whole institution of policing in this city. The struggle against violence and for peace and security are part and parcel of every social justice issue. Whether it's at work or in our communities and schools and our, our workshops, churches, houses, the environment writ large, it's, it's a big, big challenge to try to bring a real 
total understanding to making the moves that are going to make this a comfortable city for everybody to live in and not just make it a city where, let me give you all a little bit more picture of this. I used to be with the Associated Colleges of the Midwest and we used to bring students here. That's these big schools like Grinnell and Cornell and the Minnesota and Norwegian schools and St. Olaf and all of those. The white students used to come here. And I used to do an urban studies program. And for a while we used to be able to put the white students into the police stations. And the police would just stand in line to do this. To have the opportunity to drive around these young white girls and act macho and put them in squad cars. I don't know if they do this anymore, but in turn, these students would come and tell us exactly what these police had said. And the, the, the only conclusion you can come up with from this is that part of policing involves being at war in the city of Chicago. Their attitude was when they get in that station, they are then at war with the community around there of jungle buddies. The language is always nigger or jungle buddy. There is no uh, uh, language that humanizes that community. It's all about degrading and objectifying the community that they serve in. Their assumption is that it is a war. There is no assumption that they are serving or protecting in these communities. And so we'd hear this stuff echoed back by these students. Uh, they'd ride with these police in the car and the police would see a group of black youth and one would say to the girls, watch, watch what we're gonna do. Watch how they'll scatter after this. And one, then they'd do their macho thing for the girls. So it, it was very revealing as a result as to what that policing function is, is allegedly taking place. I quite ask myself the question then, what, what good is a, using a body camera if the bodies to be monitored are viewed as valueless, superfluous appendages? term they used in apartheid South Africa. It is, I think, a situation where none of us can afford to come out of this room without rethinking our values and think about how do we genuinely begin to engage and transform the basic frameworks around race in this country that have to really be wrestled with. There, there's some serious organizations across the country, I'm happy to say, that are doing this. There's an organization, for instance, called Surge in Washington, D.C. It has swelled from about 900 members to 9,000 young people that very seriously are studying and looking at race issues. But here in Chicago, I think it's another story. And I'll finish up with these thoughts. Mayoral initiatives, emotional mea culpa dramas. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have to say the name, right? New independent ombudspersons, investigatory bodies, even the Justice Department. These are not going to definitively address the depth, pervasiveness, and insidiousness the moribund U.S. institutional practices like policing and the prison system that are motored by such deep level racism and white supremacy as what we have in this country. If any of you want to just test some of this, just I suggest go spend a day at 26th in California. Just go walk around 26th in California for a day and observe and watch and listen. I take all my South African visitors to 26th in California to the courthouse and feel like what it felt in 48 and 60 
48 to 60 in apartheid South Africa, because that's what it's like at 26th in California. These challenges in this country today necessitate, I think, long distance, multilingual, creative, conversant, and engaged on, people were engaged on various fronts. There's a kind of call for a new type of artisan. I, I call them long distance runners who enlist for the duration. None of this is gonna be solved just over like that. You gotta be fully conscious. You gotta be willing. Stakes are so high. It's a ride that's up and down. You know, uh, I'll finish and just like to open up to some questions and answers, but the great actor, singer, uh, activist, uh, Paul Robeson. Anybody know Paul Robeson here? Oh, how different from my Columbia class. <laughs> I asked my Columbia classes, do you know Paul Robeson? I looked through it, thought, nobody, nobody ever heard of Paul Robeson, that great, great artist. In the midst of the Spanish Civil War, when he and others went to take a side in that battle, Paul Robeson wrote, the artist must elect to fight for freedom or for slavery. I have made my choice. I had no alternative like to fight for freedom or slavery. I, I think that's one of the things that's coming down here in Chicago. And I appeal to you all as artists to think about that. Let me open up. Do we have time, Jane? We do. Okay. Yeah. I'm not doing well on the time? You're doing great. 7-19. Oh, yeah. Jane, I tell you, you practice me very well. <laughs> <laughs> please, anybody, take yes. me through anything. Yes, please. You yeah, just tell me your name. My so name's Molly. Molly, yeah. Sister Molly. Sister Molly. Uh, you had mentioned analogies with South Africa, and maybe I mis misinterpreted, but it seems like from your discussion that perhaps you feel like a lot of the problems that they had with the apartheid have sort of been, and the hierarchy that was in place was removed and everything's better there. And I mean, did I misinterpret or, because the United States, I mean, this has been going on a really long time, and I don't understand what our problem is if, you know, if some other country can be like, okay, we're going to do away with this now, and now we've removed this, you know, and I guess that you brought up similarly the idea that police are in place to protect <coughs> the capitalist and the, the property and things like that. So it's, it's more than just race, it's also class and protecting the wealth from the, the, the poor. But I guess just I wonder about your thoughts on, on how perhaps another country was able to pull, remove this structure, it sounds like, whereas what our problem is, is what you see the differences between South Africa and how they've addressed the hierarchical racism versus United States. Molly, I take it from your question, you've been to South Africa. I never have. Has anybody been to South Africa? One, two, three, okay. Without getting into a long discussion of South Africa, let me say that it's something that would strike everybody, I think. When Nelson Mandela died, his wife was a woman named Grasa Michelle, a very, very close personal friend. And Grasa made certain that in his last months in the world, Mandela did not see the news of South Africa. She censored the news from him because it was so depressing and so sobering that she didn't want that to impact his trying to cope with his health situation. And that says to me a lot about what has happened in South Africa. There have been huge disappointments in South Africa. In August of 2014, a group of mine workers, 45 of them were shot and killed by one of the leading figures 
in the South African struggle who had led the mine workers' strike, but I'm talking about, for some of you who may not know it, uh, the former head of, uh, I've forgotten his name right now, he was the head of the mine workers' union. He is to currently Ramaphosa, serving as a deputy president. That strike that morning, he woke up in the morning that morning and called the police and he said, get the hearst ready. He called for the certain number of hearsts to be made ready to go with the police as they went to deal with these strikers. The hearst to carry the bodies. I recently had the occasion to be in a film in which he stars at the end of the film. And uh, I was just hard to watch, to be part of. I think that South Africa has, having, despite all I say, I think South Africa has had the advantage of having dealt with all their stuff at some point much more openly than what we do in this country. Uh, a discussion like we're having tonight would be wildly uh, participated in by South Africans, white and black, because I think there's more of a history of trying to openly deal with some of this. Yeah, the Truth and Reconciliation. The Truth yeah. and Reconciliation Commission hearing was one in which they said, these are the horrible things that happened. Let's at least look at them as a whole country. Now, many whites in the country called that Bishop Tutu Circus and got pissed because it took away from their television time to watch American specials like Dallas, <laughs> which they happen to love in South Africa, especially the white community. So in some ways, there are elements of the white community that are more like Americans. And I think that we just have to learn much more seriously how to engage these things and not be silent about them. How do we become much more active voices and participants and actors and artists? And how do we engage in them and not just talk about them or hear about them? Engage with a view to end them. We've never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission process here in this country. We have yet to deal with the whole question of reparations for black people in this country. Nobody even wants to talk about it. People get totally quiet when you start raising the question of giving a bunch of black folk money. <laughs> or when you start raising the question of a bunch of white folks sharing money that they got, some of it in their families, off the black backs of black folk. You know, that's just very real. You know, you know what the odd the average amount of money a black woman on welfare, what her wealth is in this country, what is it, sister? I see you nod. What is it? Does anybody know? Five dollars. Five dollars is the average wealth of a black woman on welfare in urban America right now today. Now how the hell do you reconcile that with someone like Cindy Pritzker and her brother, I went to Parker School, no one ever heard of Parker School. <laughs> Your family's up at Parker School arguing over who got a billion. <laughs> Something is tragically wrong with that. It's, it's, it's totally undemocratic. It's totally unhuman to continue a situation like that. So the inequality in this country, I think, is something we don't deal with at all. And at least in the South African Constitution, they say in that Constitution, people have a right to eat. They have a right to decent housing. They have a right to go to all the schooling they possibly can do. My poor Columbia students, I know always how to get their attention real quick when I say, OK, how many of you all got debts you got to pay? Anybody have to pay more than $40,000? Don't have <laughs> all of them. Then I have them. <laughs> and they're right there in the room with it. But it's tragic to have to do that. Anything? Question? Yes? Um, I want to try to formulate this as a question and a concise one. Um, but you talked about uh, the police mentality um, and that uh, transcending racial divides within the police community. Um, 
for instance, a, a black officer who you heard say, I would have shot his ass. That's one type of police, black right. policeman. I talked about another set of black policemen who totally challenged all of the values. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but in the, the book, um, referencing the poem that you started off Between, Between the, the World, world and Me, me. Um, he talks about, um, uh, Cotes talks about a community. No, no, wait a minute. I wasn't talking about Coatesy at all. Uh, oh, I, I understand. You, you were heard. talking about Coatesy. I am, yes. Okay. You were talking about Richard Wright. That's right. Yes. And he took the title. But all you all need to read the Coatesy book. It's worth it. Uh, it's a great discussion. Yeah. A absolutely. Um, but he mentioned in the book this community that was predominantly wealthy African American, that had a predominantly African American police force that was the worst police force or known for being particularly violent. You didn't want to get pulled over in that neighborhood. Um, which I found confusing um, for my own breakdown of trying to understand um, where the problems lie. And that obviously they're connected, but how the police mentality um, can differ from uh, white supremacy mentality or, or how they have become conflated. Obviously, I didn't succeed in my goal. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> my, brother, my brother, you raise things that we really have to dialogue about. Because this is what you all's mayor, I, I hate to say his name here, but you all know who I'm referring to. He, he often talks about the code, that he learned there's a code. What the fuck has he been doing all this time? <laughs> the mayor of Chicago, he just now learns there's a code that the po He doesn't even watch television right now. You learn that on television. There is a code. And the police in the organization I was talking about, the Afro-American Patrolmen's League, they were sanctioned horribly. That They challenged that code. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they exposed people and the crap that went on. You know, like every policeman, for instance, has a drop when they go out there. You know what that is? You all know what a drop is? That's a, that's a weapon or a knife that you have either in the trunk or you carry it around so that if you have somebody that you've got to shoot or kill, you can leave. you got something to leave. That's, that's, the drop. that's what they had that caused me. And the police all know this stuff. But it's coded that they don't talk about that. That also goes into African American communities. Mm -hmm. Because you've got African American communities that buy entirely the set of values that the police are protecting. Mm -hmm. So when they go out to Oprah land, which is what I call Chatham, <laughs> you all know who Oprah is, right? <laughs> There's a land out there that belongs to Oprah. And it's a land of grass. You've got to have wonderful lawns, just like the white people. You've got to cut them. I had a house out there and didn't cut my damn grass. <laughs> so the block club calls me in for a meeting. <laughs> Mr. Nesbitt, you've been here. I said, I'm waiting, my brothers and sisters, <laughs> for my Nubian goats to get here. <laughs> <laughs> goats are going to show you how African get grass cut quick. <laughs> it's a set of values that are just phony, just phony. But black folk want to buy into it because they want to belong. We, we want to believe. The great Margaret Walker poem, we want, we are believers in this thing. I, I, I've been lucky. My parents said to me, there are other things out there <laughs> to see and to grab hold of. But unfortunately, most people don't get those kind of exposures. Yes, please. Um, I, it's, uh, years ago, I, when it was just starting, I was friends with Reggie Robinson and Buzz Palmer and all those, you know, all those guys, terrific guys. Um, and everything you say resonates with me a lot. I don't dispute at all. But then, over here, I'm thinking, We've now had, for seven years, going on eight years, and he hasn't been assassinated, a black president. We have ta Coates writing magnificent stuff about, among other things, reparations. I never believed in reparations until I read his Atlantic piece. He makes a very persuasive case for reparations. He convinced me. So we have a black president. We have people like Coates winning MacArthur Genius Awards, just being brilliant. 
his book about you know uh, about what it means to grow up as a as a, as a black boy and a black man is is brief. And and we have now uh, the most extraordinary rap musical on Broadway, Hamilton. Hamilton, who has been largely ignored, he from the outset, having come from the West Indies, was anti-slavery, unlike Jefferson and so on. But in this rap, this brilliant rap musical, anybody can get to New York and get a ticket, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. He's too good. <laughs> Anyhow, but George Washington's played by a black guy. It, 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 the whole of our of our revolutionary history is portrayed by Hispanics and blacks and women doing men and men doing women and so on. <clears throat> and the guy who wrote it is, is Latino. So I see black president, people like Coates, art uh, like Hamilton. Um, why are we nevertheless where we are, not just in this city, but in North Charleston. I just was at a prayer service last week, the a Mother Emanuel A. New Church in, Char in Charleston. The one that was Denmark Beasley's, the one where the guy walked in and it shot shooting. It killed nine people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was sitting there and I was listening to the, because the, the head of the church was killed. I, I was listening to the new head of the church, a brilliant black man talking. And he's talking about forgiveness. I'm thinking, how the hell? We talk about forgiveness. So anyhow, my point that I'm trying to make to, 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 to get you to elaborate is there are some things that would suggest we Great ought progress. to be moving in the right direction. Yeah. Progress. Progress. How come it's not happening? Because I think, and I'm going to try to be more succinct so other people can talk. I think the fact of the matter is that that progress really affects touches a few people. It touches, it, and here class forces come in. It touches people who have mobility. It touches people who kids go to private schools. It touches people who get out and travel. But we can walk tonight, you and I, right over there, four blocks from here, to Kedzie and Madison, and watch all the unemployment that's just out here on these streets from generations of people who have not been impacted in any way and are not impacted by the things you're talking about. And until we begin to address that level with real massive programs, giving people jobs, gives people education, we aren't gonna make any progress. Have you spent time in a public school in the ghetto in this city? It's one of the greatest travesties. Travesties. That's all there is to it. No wonder teachers get burned out in this city. The system isn't designed to educate. It's designed to burn these young people out, whether they're black, white, whatever. And that's the good teachers do it three years, and then they're out. Now, luckily, we've got a union that's saying, we're going to try to get a better set of conditions, but look at the fight that union is going to have to have. We're getting ready to have one of the ugliest strikes probably in the history of this country coming up very, very soon. And that's all related to things like the structural characteristics of an administration that really does not want to see resources come into the neighborhoods of a state administration that doesn't give a damn and of a white racism that's behind all that, white supremacy, that still won't let there be fair amounts, fair, compensatory amounts of capital and money come into neighborhoods that haven't ever had the resources that they need to get real educational programs going. And they die before that. And the sadness is that many of those white farmer communities in southern Illinois, they have been, but the game has been whooped on them. And they believe that anybody talks to them about the changing resources, that they're going to die. That's communism taking over. They have no future in that. And, 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 and they believe in things like, let's get more prisons so that we can have jobs down here in southern Illinois. And we don't care if, if they're black people that are mistreated. That makes no difference. We got a job, a prison 
that we can run just like we want to run it. It gives some jobs to our relatives, and it's better than not having the cows any longer. Um, you talked about guns really briefly at the beginning. I was wondering if you could speak a little more. Uh, the question that I have a lot is, we talk about gun culture in this country, immediately one image comes to mind, which is these like Yal Qaeda dudes in Oregon. But it seems to me that uh, gun culture is more pervasive than just a bunch of white privileged dudes, that guns are everywhere in every type of hands, causing every type of damage from those men to young people of color in this city shooting each other through the police. I was wondering if you could just talk about guns for a second. We're in a culture, we're in a country of great fear. Fear is on so many levels and it manifests itself in so many ways. And I think the one thing, the one thing that everybody often turns to is a gun. And, and you, I think you'd be surprised at who has guns. Uh, and that's true for poor people. It's true for people with money. It's true for certainly people that are living in desperate circumstances. It's certainly true for white people who have been psyched into believing, and some really believe this, that unless they have a gun, these black hordes in these cities are gonna move in and rape their daughters and take their mothers, and, and they're waiting right there. And so they are flocking to get guns. And it's very racialized. It, it isn't covered that way, but the bottom line is race in this race to get guns, all kinds of guns. And of course, the NRA loves this and works this as part of working the whole political structure, the economic structure of producing and manufacturing guns for the world. So I think that's also part of it. And then lastly, I think the other piece of it is that there's a lot of insecurity. And the only way they know it's very fair, phallic. The only way they know, men particularly, is to get a gun. There is no other way to deal with situations. Anybody? Yes, please. I'm sorry. Please, my um, I wanted to ask about confrontation uh, and rewind a little bit back to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, it's like we we want to believe that we're ready for algebra, but we're really just like learning our numbers. We're still like, we're still not even there. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you feel about confrontation, how to perpetuate confrontation, because I feel like we're in the middle of the city of a confrontation. We're on the verge of it all the time because of the way the city is, is made, um, is designed. But then also, you, so there's that, there's that natural erupting confrontation under the surface all the time. Whether some woman clutches her purse when I sit down next to her on the train, or so I have to look over my shoulder to make sure that someone else who's looking over their shoulder feels comfortable in my neighborhood. Um, but then there's this whole other confrontation of me being one of very few, because I'm the one who slipped through the cracks, who got that 10% of privilege that you get. But now I'm one of very few everywhere. I live in Goldenberg. So I, I want to, if you can pontificate, a little, bit, a little bit as an elder on confrontation um, to help me figure out that how to pursue confrontation because I, I think surely we'll never get we'll never get there unless we get to confrontation. These are very sensitive questions you ask. Mm -hmm. There are things that I would suggest that we need to dialogue about more. The black community and in communities that are <coughs> totally identified with us need to learn about and be ready to talk about too and support us. They're very hard things. Uh, I laugh and laughingly talk about what it's like to walk around as a black man in the city of Chicago today in terms of getting on an elevator. <laughs> I get in an elevator and I feel the white women shrink up against the sides. And so sometimes I'll go, <laughs> <laughs> you got to turn some of these situations into humor. You know? <laughs> they would drive you crazy, literally. But I think that the other thing is that we have to go through these things with groups of people. 
and to talk about them and have people that we can constantly talk about these things with. And otherwise, they really literally will drive you into the ground. Um, I think my anger has not dissipated in the years, but it has become disciplined. It has become, and it, I, I don't credit that with this country. I credit that with the wonderful experiences I've had, been fortunate to have, with extraordinary people like, say, Nelson Mandela, who has been through 35 years of incredible hell and comes out the other side with a big perspective on these things. I think the other thing is that we are in a period where women particularly, uh, this is, I can't even get into this right now because it's, it's so hard for me to discuss because I lost my sister through the violence of this system against women. And it was done through her husband. And so, I, I think that's one of the hardest things we have to cope with. And that the, it brings together these strands. And I think the other part of it is that art can do a long, go a long way to try to relieve a lot of that. That's, that, that builds up in you and drives you mad otherwise, unless there's some outlet. I think we're beginning, yes please. I was just wondering, I think it's in relationship to your question about confrontation, is um, you know, I was uh, reading uh, some writings of the, of the nuns of, um, who are part of the liberation theology movement, speaking to the sense of um, we are nothing without community if not just imagined, and speaking to things like the TAMS, your 10 campaign, these ideas that, that you can isolate a body, but but how do we survive the turmoil? We survive it somehow communally. And here we are in this room full of artists and, and artist community in Chicago, community of hopefully iconoclasts and creators and visionaries and um, destructionists in various realms and forms. And I just wonder, in the face of, of all that we're facing in Chicago at this pivotal moment with um, racial violence in the police system and the failure of our state to support anybody poor, working poor, and artists are part of the working poor. I'm just thinking, communally speaking, are you seeing any communities that are stepping forward and speaking to these issues or speaking to them in an eloquent way or, or touching on that confrontation, you know, bridging the points that are actually happening in the community. Are there any examples or lights that we can begin to look to and follow or, you know, like look to as inspiration as we move forward right now? It just feels like such a pivotal moment. I think there are a lot of things happening that we don't know. It's such a huge city, but that there has to be created better ways that we learn about them and share them with each other. I think they've had incredible moments coming out of the Black Lives Matter and the BYOP and the young folk that have been doing this wonderful stuff and learning and growing. And they have wonderful concepts that old horses are learning from. Uh, Jesse was talking to me the other day. He said, man, Nesbitt, you know what these young people, they, they ain't leaders, they're leaderful. I said, yeah, Jesse, I wish I had heard you heard that about 20 years ago. <laughs> so I think that these things are happening, but they aren't always communicated to very large numbers of people. Like this gathering tonight, who would have thought it? And I know a whole lot of folk out there would love to hear this discussion. They might not hear, understand it all. They might not be there, but they'd love to just see the energy, feel the energy. And I think that's another thing we gotta get better at doing, is taking this stuff out to the broadest number of people, all kinds of people, at all levels. There's a wonderful poem, Forge Simple Words, which even children can understand. In our land, 
bullets are beginning to flower. And it's about the revolutionary situation of Mozambique. And they were saying that out of this struggle, you had flowers that were coming up out of the bullets. And that's what we need to see happen on the west side, is to see some of, that, some, some of the managing of all that confrontation and see more creative, caring struggle that takes place. Not easy. Yes, my brother. Uh, as someone, uh, similar to the leader there, uh, who has uh, made it out in a way. Uh, I'm from DC. I grew up in you know the middle of everything in DC, and I live in Logan Square now. I'm an actor. I'm a you know writer. I went to college, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what strikes me is is the fact that we live in a city right now that is the third most segregated in in the country, and thinking about how my group of friends and I have a you know, large group of friends, but a lot of them do are, are white now, and uh, trying to continue to keep my stories out there and let them know that, that I may have gotten to that 10%, but I still experience so much of this. And the issue I run into so often is the frustration of your, of, oh my God, I feel so sorry for you. Oh my God, this is a terrible thing. And me being like, no, I'm telling the story because it happens every day to me, but 14 times a day to this month over here. You know, like it does. <laughs> and so this idea of how, in a, city, in a city that is so segregated, how do we address the understanding gap between, say, those who are oppressed in these neighborhoods and those who might have the agency and power who are not currently being oppressed to understand just the level and depth of that. I think we've got to get people out into these communities. We've got to get people out. I, I, I do a tour of the city of Chicago. It's one of the things I've decided I won't do much more. And in the summertime, we walk a lot of it. In the wintertime, you do it in car. But you get all over. You get over and you, you, you begin to know Lawndale and K-Town, and you get out in the little village, and you get out into Chatham, and you get out in, into the Inglewood, and you get into Woodlawn, and you get even up into the north side, you know, the far northwest side. And I think that unless that happens here, we are in danger of simply reproducing the same old patterns of non-understanding and, and hostility. There's a wonderful artist friend of mine that's doing a very fascinating thing on the subways. She has, she is, she's having dinners on the subway. Her name is Rhoda Rosen. And on the 95th Street stop and on the Howard stop, for folk up and down, they have major sit-down meals mm -hmm. right on the platform. The next thing she's doing is she's fighting to get bathrooms for folks that have to live on those subways, on trains, and buses. Because you are, I don't know if you notice this, this is more backwards archaic. As an old man, I noticed this shit. <laughs> there ain't no bathrooms. And there are places, these restaurants, they don't want you to even come in to use the damn bathroom. What kind of backwards, unsophisticated <laughs> kind of behavior is that? So, I think, but we have to get people out and we have to push ourselves to constantly keep expanding our horizons, our networks. I, I, love, I love seeing this city see a lot of different people and things. I'm so tired of going to all white parties or all black parties or Latino parties or Asian parties. Shit, let's just bring everybody together and work and you gotta struggle. It's all a struggle, and I think that's a message to me. Thank you all very much. <laughs>